Hi. Hello. Hello, everyone. So my name is Olga Vat. Uh, I'm independent curator, and I would like to introduce uh, uh, you my colleague and my co-curator, uh, Elena Nikanolian. Uh, hello, I'm also independent curator, new media artist, and we are uh, working together on a project data sets versus mindsets, post-solid explorations of the digital control society. And um, this project is dedicated to the idea of what can happen and uh, uh, what can we do uh, when and uh, post-Soviet mindset and post-Soviet mentality meets digitalization. And also another important uh, question that we uh, rose during uh, our research uh, was how uh, in this new norm, uh, normal situation, uh, physical and digital reality mix and uh, influence uh, each other and how uh, the new ethics, uh, the new uh, ethics uh, in the digital era, uh, human rights and uh, in the digital sphere and uh, management of uh, data resources uh, is operated. Uh, so yes. And uh, I think we can uh, to tell, tell you a little bit about the exhibition. Uh, first, first uh, a small introduction that our project has actually three parts. So it's uh, one very important part is exhibition that takes place physically in uh, Moscow uh, in Electro Museum Gallery, which is one now uh, one of the main um, main centers of uh, new media arts uh, in uh, in Moscow. Uh, we have, of, co uh, of course, online conference that we are presenting today. And uh, uh, this Friday, uh, we have a performative project, a program uh, with uh, uh, art, uh, Moscow-based ba artists and uh, well, visual artists and sound artists. Uh, and this program will be also uh, webcasted uh, on the website of Ars Electronica. Uh, it, will, it will take place uh, on at 7.30 Moscow time. Uh, so I would uh, invite you to join us on Friday as well. So, and uh, now, of course, we would like to speak about the exhibition that uh, is on view in Moscow and uh, available online. Uh, yes, and uh, we have around 15 projects at the exhibition. And these projects are also presented online. You can uh, check out our uh, website, uh, datasetsmindsets.com. And uh, we have... Uh, uh, well, well, we also have uh, this um, interactive interface. You can see it here. When you connect to the website, you can give access to the camera of your device, and it starts to recognize the emotions of your face. And then your user experience is uh, totally unique because it. Uh, uh, so the, the like uh, the uh, order of projects uh, you will experience is uh, uh, related to your emotional state recognized by machine. Uh, so it's kind of like relational uh, aesthetics, uh, which we are exploring through, through this uh, uh, interactive interface. Uh, so it works like this. Uh, the, the emotions can be recognized by AI. And uh, what is also important that we don't, do not store any data and all computations are carried out on, uh, on your local machine only. Um, so you can check our site. And uh, well, yes, we have around 15 projects and uh, five performances. And uh, we have to say that we, we want to express our great attitude to Alexei Shulgin and Aristotle Chernyshov, uh, because uh, many of these projects are made by uh, students and um, uh, alumni of Rochenka Art School. And uh, actually, Alexei and Aristar, they're developing a new media arts community for many, many years. So this is kind of a result of this uh, long work. Yes, and so our aim of the project, I mean, one of the aims was to present uh, a few generations of new media arts, artists uh, that work in uh, Russia, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan. 
and uh, um, so Alexei and uh, Aristarch represent a very uh, important generation uh, that we are presenting. And uh, we, uh, in the frame of the exhibition, uh, we chose uh, artworks and artists who uh, critically uh, Ref reflect on uh, new digital tools and uh, new means of uh, digital control and uh, that is being used uh, on uh, post-Soviet uh, space. Well, so I think we, we, can, um, we can show you our uh, website just uh, for one moment. Uh, so today is a very important uh, uh, moment for us because we are yeah. finally launching uh, our website, which is more than a website, uh, as uh, Yelena told, uh, but it's uh, an online version of our project. Yes, but, well, you, you, you cannot, you cannot, uh, I, I cannot show you now this uh, web um, navigation through through the camera because my camera camera is used by uh, Zoom, so I cannot show this. But you can you can just check it so when you connect to the site, so you can see some projects. Uh, like, well, yes, and actually, I think um, uh, we should start the conference and. Uh, um, our first speaker is Lev Manovic, Dr. Lev Manovic. He's an artist and also director of Cultural Analytics Lab. And um, he's um, also a computer scientist. And uh, he will talk about uh, digital, uh, digital culture in Russia and uh, the rest of the world. Uh, please. Um, thank you so much, and uh, it's very, very exciting to be part of this panel, which features uh, the most cutting-edge thinkers, curators, and also artists. Artists sometimes are curators today um, in Russia and the uh, Soviet world. Um, so um, we only have 15 minutes. So what I want to talk about is the effect of scale on culture in the 21st century. Um, you know, when I started in digital arts around 1984, like 36 years ago, and probably all the people who were doing 3D computer animation, which is what I was working in, you can put them in one room. Um, in uh, you know, 1997, ZKM has opened, right, the Center for Art and Media in Germany, and uh, you know, a few hundred people who had an active career in this field also all gathered pretty much in one big ballroom. And then something happened in the beginning of 21st century. So by 2002, 2003, I have realized that the number of people engaged with digital arts and culture has suddenly became so big, it's impossible for me to keep track of interesting work. So before you go to Art Electronica or Transmediale, or you go to ZKM exhibitions, literally four or five places, you see everybody, it's a small community, you know, and whatever few amazing, groundbreaking original projects which were presented, you know, that year, you would see them all. And suddenly, beginning of 2000, because of uh, democratization of computing, because of new languages like processing, um, because many places started uh, undergraduate and graduate programs in digital art, this field started to explode. And this is why for the last 15 years, Instead of focusing my energy on writing about particular digital artists or particular digital artworks, I've been trying to see if I can use methods from computer science, data science, artificial intelligence to track this growth of global culture worldwide. So ideally, in a kind of utopian sense, I would like to have an interface, like a kind of Google uh, Analytics, except for you know, contemporary culture, this interface ideally would take into account all the artworks, all the cultural artifacts, all the interactions, all the festivals taking place every year, and would both show me you know, recurrent keywords, how these keywords emerge, uh, and also lead me to a few 001% of works which are original. Um, so I've been working on this for 15 years, 
Meanwhile, the digital culture has been getting bigger and bigger, so it becomes more and more difficult to track it. And I will just show you a few graphs from um, my most recent project called Elsewhere, uh, where I propose a new methodology to follow and to track uh, contemporary culture. The term Elsewhere refers to both you know, the South, the Global South, and Global East. It basically refers to what sometimes people in the metropolitan areas call you know, provinces, right? It's people who live outside of New York, Tokyo, London, and so on. Um, and the question is, you know, where do new ideas, images, imaginations come from? Do we still come from major cities? What is the role of smaller cities? For example, the cities below 1 million people or below 500,000 people. What is the role of art schools located, again, in the middle of nowhere? So uh, has location became irrelevant? Is location still matters? How does this play in terms of cultural concepts? Where do cultural concepts originate? Uh, I mean, it's a very big project. In reality, I would need to have thousands of PhD students. I'm kind of doing it you know, with just a couple of people. So let me bring, show you some results of what we have so far. Okay. Um, so this is a paper I'm literally finishing and will submit to the Journal of Cultural Analytics in uh, next week. Uh, so I'm planning to write you know, a few papers based on this data, which we collected, and also you know, make online projects. Uh, this first paper is about methodology. It's called Measuring Growth and Diffusion of Contemporary Culture in 21st Century. And the basic idea is like this, right? So for the last uh, 13, 14 years, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of computer scientists and also people in communication, internet studies, uh, computational social science and so on, have been very good in using online information to track social cultural issues. So there are tens of thousands of papers which look at YouTube genres, uh, popularity of different genres of photos on Instagram, how do people use you know, Twitter during various political events, all this stuff exists. And what I realized four years ago is that now that this research has become very established, there's something else which people have missed, that during you know, 20 years, so we're already 20% into the 21st century, we saw not only phenomenal growth of digital culture, but we also saw equally strong, or perhaps as, as strong, growth of physical culture. So the idea of this new methodology, which I developed around 2015, and then slowly got funding, it did some work uh, web University in Siberia, and now continuing uh, here in South Korea, where I'm now working with another Russian university, is to try to collect large data about physical cultural events, even look at distribution of these events, where do these events take place, what are their topics, and look at descriptions of these events, which are posed to try by organizers on various platforms uh, to basically create the first time space maps of development of global culture. Right, um, so that's the description of methodology. So we use data about cultural events from various global platforms. Some of these platforms are used also to organize these events, such as Meetup or, for example, TED Local, TEDx. And because uh, these announcements of these events usually have metadata, which is where locations, timestamps, and also text descriptions, you can apply kind of data science uh, standard methods and uh, figure out how global culture has been developing. Of course, not all of it, but how it's been represented by this particular data set. So literally, I just want to show you a few graphs. Um, so this is you know, the data we collected so far. Um, each data set, each source was chosen uh, because it represents something different. So there are meetup events, about two and a half million. Uh, there's also Behance account. So Behance is a kind of virtual event when somebody right, posts a project so we wanted to compare the diffusion of digital culture and physical culture. There's uh, 26,000 TED local events. There are two mailing lists for art and uh, art and education, EFLUX and art education. And, there are, and then there are also free uh, sources to compare global and the local. So free Russian sources, TimePad, uh, Ministry of Culture, uh, list of events you know, they sponsor, and also theory of practice, which is a website out of Moscow about kind of lots of intellectual lectures. Um, so there are differences in terms of which countries uh, you know, uh, use this different sites right, uh, most often. If you look at the cities, we start seeing some interesting patterns. 
So the first two columns represent the kind of art world, right, and art education. And you can see we're almost completely dominated by the West. Only Mexico City and Singapore appears here in place seven and eight. The rest of it, right, is all uh, Western world. Once we go to Behance, it's very different, right? It's a kind of platform where everybody can enter and make an account. So we see Moscow is the number three. Uh, we have Kiev also, and we also have St. Petersburg, you know, so major post-Soviet cities are there. Uh, and then let's look, look at some graph. So the next question, of course, is, you know, how fast uh, the numbers of these events have been growing uh, during these uh, years. So the earliest platform, which we have, the first events we have is from 2003. We finished data collection spring of 2019. So that's about 17 years. And the growth has been phenomenal, right? So the growth has been different on different platforms, but we all grow, as you can see, very, you know, very strongly, very systematically. And if you average it between all these different platforms, overall, in 10 years, between 2009 and 2018, the number of events, the number of cultural events worldwide as represented on these platforms have grown 10 times. 10 times in 10 years. If this is not, you know, simply digital events, this is events which require, you know, some funding, resources. Uh, this is not virtual art electronica, it's real art electronica. You can also see some patterns. Uh, so interesting question, how does the last economic and social crisis has affected growth of culture? You can see that, for example, time pad and meetup just keep growing as though nothing happened. With uh, EFLUX and TED, you know, there is a bit of a slowdown. Uh, but of course, you know, that doesn't tell us anything that will happen in the next two years because the economic crisis hasn't really started yet worldwide. Uh, but at least the last time when the crisis was very serious, we can see it didn't have a very big effect. Uh, and then what's interesting to compare this to a uh, much longer uh, cultural you know, series, which is the growth of art biennials. So, you know, the first art biennials was Venice, 1896. And then uh, we counted all the unique biennials, which are still taking place. In 2018, it was 200. And you can see that the growth has been very strong, but of course it's not 10 times, right? So between 1990 and 2000, it's about two, you know, two, two plus times, and then it's a bit less, and then it's a bit less. So in terms of our biennials, actually, right, the most rapid growth was in the 90s, and then it became a bit slower. Um, so just a few more graphs. So the interesting thing is how does this contemporary culture, as represented by these platforms, is been diffusing around the world. So this looks at the number of unique cities which appear uh, on these platforms every year, and you can see it's basically linear growth. It's linear growth. Right, so in 2006, maybe we had a few hundred cities. By 2018, we have actually um, something like over 12,000 unique cities uh, per year. And overall, we found 21 unique uh, thousand cities in the data. If you look at number of countries, there's something else. So there's a big growth, and then it reaches a certain saturation, right? But of course, once you get to 180 countries, that's almost everybody, because there's only 200, 200 countries worldwide. And I'll just show you uh, just a few more graphs. So this is plotting the growth on, uh, this is plotting number of countries, right, on different platforms. So you can see how certain events, which are more about technology and intellectual life, right, we reach, we kind of plateau 140 countries. The uh, art events, right, each plateau of about 60 countries. So that's very interesting. And uh, finally, you know, the last graph, and that's uh, another paper I'm now working on with people in Krasnoyarsk, which is in a big Russian city, big Russian university. So we're looking at the role of cities of different sizes, right? So it's obvious that there are lots of events in Moscow, in Montreal, in Tokyo, and so on. What about smaller cities, right? Our Linz, which been housing arts electronic is a kind of exception, right? Most cities are not Linz. So what we see here is, again, interesting patterns. So um, for the smaller cities, less than 1 million people, we have completely linear growth. And then, uh, in fact, uh, for cities of different sizes, there are different patterns. So I don't have any kind of huge uh, take home points yet. Uh, this is still work in progress, but uh, the key point is that not only digital culture, but also physical culture has been growing tremendously in the last 20 years. Uh, and I think we see the effects of this you know, in the content. So for me, it's kind of very really difficult, in fact, to watch all the streams from Art Electronica uh, as somebody who's been in this field for 36 years. All I see is endless genres and keywords, right? 
uh, you know, VR, you know, environment, uh, you know, this and that sensors. And I wonder if the uh, effect of a scale is not to have more diversity of content, aesthetic, and so on, but in fact, potentially it leads to less diversity because maybe people follow each other, maybe people imitate each other, people copy each other. Uh, and of course, you know, that's um, you know, large questions. So we can also think about culture, way scientists think about various uh, scientific domains, right? What is the effect of growth on diversity? Not diversity of participation. Yes, everybody can participate today, but do we have anything original to say? So these are very big questions. I hope to get to them eventually. And thank you so much for your time. Um, and I'm looking forward to the rest of this interesting panel. Thank you. Thank you, Lev. Thank you so much for this interesting topic. So we have uh, uh, a few minutes before the next uh, speaker, uh, actually 10, so maybe we can uh, switch to some questions. And oh. I... Uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, I mean, I, didn't, I, wasn't ho I wasn't even hoping. You know, yes, the best so. thing is, you know, as you, can see, as you can see from this highlight, right? I've been trying to set up like my home video studio here in Des, and, and you know, I still have, I don't have diffuser. And I have this bigger, you know, I have this big thing. So I'm, I'm you guys like it with nothing called fire and nothing crashed. You could literally, <laughs> I'm like sitting here, you know, with my, with my lights and, uh, you know, trying to figure it all out. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. yeah, maybe maybe I can ask one question because we have please, like please. 10 minutes before the next. Uh, wow. So yeah. you <laughs> Let me get some water. Let me get some water. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much for being so brief uh, because we have very. I was. I was. I was like, yeah. <laughs> okay. First time in my life. <laughs> anyway. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what is your hypothesis? I mean, uh, so how do you connect uh, this less diversity in cultural models and cultural products and so on and so on? So, do you connect it with the uh, growth of? You know, cultural management, so that the culture is becoming uh, more and more uh, appropri appropriated by uh, the big, you know, powerful entities and big money and uh, part of cultural politics and so on and so on. So yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Well, first of all, you know, uh, the reason I kind of turned to this quantitative, uh, empirical, right, kind of material methods is I thought. Uh, 15 years ago, our contemporary culture has become so big that we all see particular corners, right? And we all have our hypothesis. Like, I think maybe it became less diverse, but maybe I'm completely wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, the problem, once you start trying to figure out how to measure diversity, how do you measure uh, the differences between this topic and this topic, it also becomes problematic, but people do it in data science, and this challenge itself is very interesting. Uh, so one thing we're going to do, but we haven't done it yet, since we have millions of descriptions of all these events, covering 17 years, we can extract, you know, topics, keywords, and so on, and we can simply see, right, if, like, for example, the list of topics is getting bigger, right? So maybe, in fact, mm -hmm. you know, maybe it is it is becoming bigger. Maybe I simply think of this is less diverse because I've been around this field, right, for, for decades. But I think, but I wanted to say one thing. If those of you who are a bit older like me remember that the arts were very different in the 80s and in the 90s. You didn't have lots of grants. You didn't have like millions of MFA programs. Our art world was very small, both commercial, non-commercial. And um, I think uh, it was a bit more spontaneous. Right? Once we moved to you know, uh, tens of thousands of MFA programs, grants, uh, you know, whereas a whole generation of artists, right, who live by, by going from residency to residency, I think the fact that artists suddenly have to write you know, descriptions of their projects, and they have to uh, write grant proposals, and they have to write proposals for um, the residencies and so on. Perhaps, perhaps it had, maybe it allowed more artists to make a living, but maybe it had negative effects on the content because people have to describe their work in a very formal way. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we see here, it's actually electronic, right? There is almost not so much talk about, well, is this work successful? If people enjoyed it, everybody tells us, okay, I use VR, I use data, I use this and that, right? So people tell us, like, okay, like, what, what did I use? So I check over boxes. Yes, mm -hmm. it's art electronic already. But, but when, you know, what, maybe it didn't work. Maybe it was very banal, right? Maybe nobody has seen it. Uh, and I think that, uh, I mean, that's what I think happens in general, not only in the arts. Once any area becomes very big, right? It becomes more formal. 
and then I think, uh, especially today in the time of uncertainty, right? I mean, nobody wants to be very original, right? I mean, people want to be original, but we want to get grants, we want to go to write MFA programs, we want to be Dr. Tronica. Some people write their proposals, everybody checks all those boxes, and I think you get perhaps, perhaps you get more complacency. But mm -hmm. you guys are young curators, you're over in the field. I'm like, you know, I'm like, you know, old, old, you know, star pure, right? So, mm -hmm. but that's my feeling is that, you know, once you, so paradoxically, right, this expansion, which in theory should lead to more diversity, right? Precisely because everybody's competing, I think, for a smaller number of exhibitions, places, curated attention, and so on, perhaps uh, paradoxically it leads to uh, more conformity. But that's my hypothesis. I don't know if it's what I'm going to find. <laughs> so, yeah, well, we're talking a, a lot about uh, new standards that are uh, arriving and uh, being uh, fixed and followed uh, in, this, in the field. Okay, okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lev. So maybe we can uh, switch to another... Uh, yes, to our next speaker. speaker. Yeah, what do you think? Okay, super. So we would like uh, to introduce uh, Alla Mitrofanova. Uh, she is an independent researcher, art critic. Uh, she is a participant of cyber feminist uh, movement and creator of uh, Philosophical Cafe. It's an open seminar on contemporary philosophical thoughts. <laughs> and a philosopher. Yeah, sure. Hello, thank you for organizing this event. Uh, I am not uh, such scientific and I am very far from mainstream. And uh, I am not an artist, I am not a producer, not a curator, I am a simple philosopher. That's why I, uh, I'm very curious uh, what sense we could plug in our contemporary technological reality. So if it could be a big data philosophy and what it means to have big data ontology. Ontology, supposedly we need this uh, term because it helps, uh, it's an uh, old-fashioned term, but it helps us to uh, organize our relationship with things, with knowledge, with ourself, and uh, with our values. So uh, ontology hardly connected with ethic. And uh, in my uh, topic, you see a march to Walter Benjamin epoch of big data. So uh, philosophy of the epoch of big data. Uh, what kind of uh, philosophical uh, the suppositions we have now in contemporary philosophy? Of course, we have uh, neo-materialism, we have post-humanism, we have object-oriented philosophy, we also have uh, a big line on of more new titles like flat ontology, toy ontology, dark ontology, and even we have slime ontology. And so what means uh, ontology in, uh, uh, in traditional is a strong view. It's not uh, thinking how things are organized and represented. It's uh, un uh, un thinking philosophically, it means we think about how access or rules of access into knowledge and into reality is organized. So uh, I propose to think about uh, big data philosophy uh, is thinking about new access of uh, to knowledge, new rules of access, and uh, what access what we have tradition as a traditional access. We have two stable points uh, like foundations which are on distance to each other, subject, object, nature, uh, culture, power, um, substraction, uh, ideal material, and so on. But those two uh, stable points uh, doesn't work, they're empty. But space in between, which was empty in classical uh, 
access rules now is full of different systems of measuring, different uh, systems of data. Uh, data is always produced in space of between, which is not body, not mind, uh, in uh, previous uh, concepts. So uh, data is measuring and marking, and uh, it looks like alphabet with words. It uh, has no meaning sometimes, but it has new too. And uh, those data is organized in assemblage and operations. And so we have to understand how this space in between, which is so multiple and so unstable, could be taken in sense in the history of philosophy. And for me, it's, uh, I will uh, um, stay on the idea that paradigm shift was, uh, was done in the beginning of 20th century. Uh, what it means, uh, paradigm shift, it means that uh, completely new ideas came, that reality is not stable anymore for those people. It, it could be changeable in political, in aesthetic, in uh, scientific sense, and uh, art in that time goes direct, uh, goes very close with science. So uh, it's kind of one way of thinking which goes uh, to each other, uh, to meet each other. So body meets mind. And uh, it means that my uh, body is not any more homogeneous uh, piece of nature. So it, it could be marked and measured and reconnected differently. And new disciplines appear. Uh, discipline neurophysiology, uh, technique of perception, uh, sociology, uh, and, any, uh, any, and many others. And all those disciplines uh, grasp in one, in one field of research, grasp nature and culture. It means that there is no more mind which still be independent from body, and there is no body which still be independent from mind. And uh, a lot of new languages appear in that time. It's kind of proto-data. For example, there is a language, body language, which was developed by uh, Nikolai Bernstein and Alexei Gastiev uh, to analyze uh, movement. Movement is not a simple movement. It's a, a system, uh, it's a, a conjunction of many systems, uh, muscles, neurons, uh, and so, uh, psychic and mental. And uh, from that point, we could just jump uh, straightly into our time. And we could see uh, how Bale uh, of MacGregor, uh, how organized uh, Bale dancers, and how it, he's, uh, they are trained with a computer program which uh, grasp uh, motion and uh, makes variations with motions and then train the uh, dancer uh, back. So uh, our bo uh, so body from that point is a variation of many systems. Uh, is very flexible, very um, pl plastic. Why? Not because it's uh, slime but because it's multi-system uh, model. And what we have, uh, which is uh, uh, not always pleasant, uh, we practically don't have natural body. And it, it produced fear because in our traditional understanding from 19th century, uh, our subjectivity has uh, as own 
property our body and uh, that means that our body should be hidden secret and mysterious to uh, let us to be free as a subject but now we don't have such uh, property our body is expanded exhibited in many disciplines and uh, that that makes for many people uh, unsafe uh, feeling and also people are afraid to be controlled to become bi biopolitically uh, exploited but uh, I would say that uh, it's not a problem of biopolitics, it's a problem of cultural paradigm shift. So the, there is no way to escape from uh, such body exhibition, uh, there, but there are ways to study that new cultural situation, to exploit it and to change uh, some uh, algorithms to extract data differently. Uh, so if we have uh, a lot of data and we cannot uh, uh, make filter, so we have to do how we could organize uh, assemblages of data. And that's why algorithm and ethic and ontology is important. Uh, from one point, we have uh, new strange collectives. For example, collective with uh, bees on the piece of uh, Natasha Fyodorova. She tries to organize communication with bees using their smell language and try to uh, collect such smell which could be included in our smell communication. And there is another project with uh, uh, gene comparis comparison between human and uh, fruit flies. So it's another companion speeches. Uh, so we don't have our body as a, a straight piece of nature, homogeneous, but we have a lot of uh, expanded uh, relatives. So uh, my metaphor is that we have kind of knitting ontology, but knitting ontology doesn't produce uh, straight body lines, but it produces uh, a lot of relationships uh, which cannot close our agency, cannot stop our agency. That's why the best uh, ethic to include all e agencies from different um, data, from different assemblage, from different configurations of reality, of objects, is hospitality. And uh, this uh, concept is uh, developed by Irina Aristarchova in her book Hospitality of Matrix, and uh, she studied on relationships uh, with uh, example of uh, traditional hospitality, with example of motherhood, with example of uh, friendship, and uh, especially with example of op being open to any event, H how we could be open to any event which we not control, uh, not uh, uh, this event doesn't depend on us, but we still uh, she st uh, still think that we could organize self-organize our uh, practice to be able to uh, hold such uh, openness. And uh, my last uh, example is uh, to are two pieces by Masha Dancers and German Lavrovsky, and they study exactly this uh, algorithm or this practice of hospitality. Uh, Masha Dancers works with uh, community of women who play with uh, baby, uh, baby dolls, 
and pretend that they are mothers. So uh, there is no objects. There is no real mothers, but algorithm, uh, relationships, uh, reflection of these relationships is very hard. So they simulate uh, or they expo expose uh, algorithm of uh, pure uh, care, assistance, um, openness. And another project is a project of German Lavrovsky. Uh, he also did a baby toy, but in sense of a queer object. And this queer object uh, was uh, part of many performances. Uh, in performances, people try to analyze and express their feelings and relationship with so this uh, queer, queer object. And that also they try to organize new relationships of uh, uh, friendship, uh, hospitality. And I think such projects could be uh, more... Uh, could be very important for new anthology. It's very marginal now, but uh, there is no way for new anthology to keep uh, safe, uh, to be safe, uh, keeping unbalanced uh, multitude of practice. So I would say in political sense that there is no way, but we have to develop uh, uh, practice of assistance, care, uh, and so on, uh, to, uh, to be safe in instability, in multiplicity, in uh, knitting ontologies. That's, uh, so that's all. That's my joke uh, in honor to Quentin Miesu, uh, because uh, he proposed that reality is not reality, which is a uh, natural object, which is somewhere very far, but reality is what is done as reality through many practices in the space and between uh, in opposite classical uh, epistemology. So, thank you. Thank you, Alla, so much for this uh, beautiful metaphor of uh, neat and ontology, and also that you mentioned about the practice of assistance and care, which uh, uh, is uh, really important uh, now. And we see that uh, in the last few months, uh, when uh, uh, we all face the COVID situation. There was this you know, high uh, uh, activity uh, within the non-hierarchical, sorry for my pronunciation, but non-hierarchical uh, projects and uh, independent uh, initiatives. Uh, I was <laughs> I wanted to switch to our uh, project with with Elena that this was actually organized independently with uh, help of uh, with a really huge help of uh, the community and um, yeah. Well, uh, I, I wanted to add that the project about bees communication is actually a collaborative project by me and Natalia Fodorova. It's not. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. And I really like the idea about big data. And uh, this is like uh, as a. Um, as a, some new way to extract knowledge from from big data, because it reminded me also of Matthew Pasquinelli. He writes about AI uh, in this context uh, as about tool to extract uh, knowledge from big data. Uh, but he writes that it's not like a neutral tool as uh, any tool actually. Well, thank you, thank you for for your presentation. Thank you so much. Actually, we have a question by uh, Elif Manovich. He wrote it in the chat. <laughs> uh, so, uh, no, what, uh, actually, actually, oh, actually, I didn't write a question, but can I ask a question, perhaps? <laughs> okay. Uh, sure. Because I think I was just writing. Uh, sure. Well, actually, yeah. Sorry, I was no. It was more technical, but I wanted to thank Alla for uh, amazing, amazing kind of like a you know big, big philosophy, big data uh, kind of condensed presentation of so many ideas. It's really amazing to do force. 
And uh, maybe what I want to ask, if you guys don't mind, uh, so I think until three, four years ago, philosophers didn't really pay that much attention to big data, machine learning, but I think it changed a lot. So there's now uh, too many people writing about AI, mostly not so interesting, and there are more people writing about machine learning, including you know the, the person you mentioned, um, uh, basically, right, thinking about what does it mean that networks learn something and that we don't know how we learn. Uh, but since Ala gave us such a wonderful tour, uh, my question, uh, which philosophers or philosophical traditions in your view are most relevant, the most interesting for you uh, to uh, think about in relation to big data? Uh, I mean, for me, for example, it would be Peirce, because first of all, Peirce proposed a diagram as one of the four, four science types. And he also talked about induction, deduction, and so on. Uh, but of course, there are others. I mean, it's obvious that empirical tradition, right, is more seems to be more relevant to the big data, since you kind of right, starting to learn uh, something right from uh, you know, from data, from senses, uh, as opposed to abstract ideas. But maybe you know you have a as a professional philosopher, you may have a very very different idea. Uh, so if you want something to say, you know, but anything would be, I'm sure, very interesting. Uh, I cannot say uh, about uh, one person, but I am very interested in paradigm uh, shift in, from uh, uh, 19th century into 20th century when uh, uh, phenomenology, constructivism, and uh, multiplicity of the world came. And I think that. Uh, Mostly we read uh, those traditions separately, but it's necessary to understand why it's happened in one moment in different traditions and how it happened that they gave uh, from one point similar but different directions. And also uh, materialist dialectic here and logical empiricism here and uh, uh, so before it was hard to learn because uh, every school tried to defend uh, itself from other schools. But now we have new, what kind of new navigation in past. And I'm expecting new, uh, new researchers about uh, the common ideas between different uh, schools of uh, early 19th century. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Uh, just a quick footnote. I personally feel that the period from 1907 to 1932 was simply the single most creative intellectual and artistic period in human civilization. That's why everything happened. And I'm, I'm surprised that in the last 30 years of all the developments of internet, science, etc., you know, we don't seem to have anything similar. I mean, science is progressing, but arts and culture you know, I'm not really doing anything different from what we had in 1970, but that's uh, just my own perception, perhaps. Anyway, thank you, thank you so much for your answer, your wonderful uh, set of ideas and uh, interventions. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. And we would like to invite our next speaker, uh, Yanina Prudenko. Uh, she's a curator and founder of the Open Archive of Ukrainian Media Art and she will talk about archive of Ukrainian media art. Hello, hi, thank you very much for the introduction. Hello to everybody. I'm really glad to be a part of this uh, beautiful company of my Russian colleagues. Um, I think I can share the screen, yeah. Okay. Can you see the website of Open Archive of Ukrainian Media Art? Yes? Yes. yes. Everything yes. is fine. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yelena and Olga, for your invitation to join your project as a speaker. Uh, now I'll, <clears throat> I'll try to use my uh, 15 minutes to describe for you very briefly uh, such a post-Soviet phenomenon as Ukrainian media art. Um, despite the fact that there are no institutions, art schools, museums for media art in Ukraine, its history goes back almost uh, 30 years. 
when I started to investigate early Ukrainian uh, video art in 2008, I discovered that it exists only in anecdotes and on VHS cassettes. Uh, in 2008, I started to teach a course dedicated to the history and theory of media art in one of the universities in Kiev. And having an aim to tell a history of Ukrainian media art to my students, I started to meet artists and uh, curators. I wrote down the stories about uh, video art created by Ukrainian artists in the early 1990s. Uh, some of the artists and curators uh, brought me on our meetings uh, VHS cassettes, with which I started to uh, digitize um, in my homemade lab in the kitchen. Um, the interest of uh, Ukrainian artists um, to video art in uh, the early 1990s um, was due to several reasons. Uh, first of all, Western technologies have become um, available to artists like all other people in the post-Soviet space. Um, for example, uh, almost all early Kyiv video art was filmed on one borrowed video camera. And um, uh, the, th the second reason is uh, freedom that Ukrainian artists uh, felt. Uh, with the fall of um, Soviet Union, uh, they were no longer required to create art according to certain rules. And uh, one of those rules was traditional mediums and forms of art creation. Um, I invited you to visit the website of Open Archive of Ukrainian Media Art, which you can see now on the screen. And in section artworks, uh, you can see some early Ukrainian video artworks from Kiev, Odessa, Lviv, and Kherson. Um, eventually, I started to collaborate with CCA in Kiev, which uh, used to be CCA Soros in the past. And um, in the middle of uh, 1990s, uh, we opened two CCA Soros in Ukraine, in Kiev and in Odessa. Uh, this institution had in Ukraine advanced labs, techniques, and budgets uh, for the development of uh, digital art in Ukraine. They launched uh, the first workshops, exhibitions, uh, festivals of digital art in Ukraine. <clears throat> they raised um, up the first generation of Ukrainian digital artists. Uh, but as history has shown, it was artificially born baby at that time, at the end of the 90s and in the beginnings of the uh, 2000s. Uh, the, th the CCA Soros were closed in Kiev and Odessa at the beginning of the 2000s, and it became clear that Ukraine absolutely not prepared to support and to develop such kind of uh, art as a media art without uh, Western support, without Western institutions. Ukrainian uh, digital artists who grew up in CCA Soros went to the TV and advertising business. And now it seems um, that it was the main goal of uh, CCA Soros <laughs> in Ukraine in the 1990s. Uh, to raise technicians for new post-Soviet capitalistic reality. Yes, because TV uh, and it's in advertisement. Um, and in the late 2000s appeared um, an absolutely new generation of young Ukrainian media artists who grew up at a computer keyboard. Um, and I need to emphasize uh, that there are a few gaps between all these three generations of Ukrainian uh, media artists. Um, artists who started the experiments with video cameras, uh, cameras at the beginning of the 1990s. It's the first uh, digital artist uh, raised by CCA Soros. Um, it's the second. And uh, this new native-born uh, young uh, media artist. 
um, there is um, a very simple explanation for this, for these gaps. Um, all these artists never had the possibility to teach in art academies or in art colleges or in art schools and so on. All these institutions still are in an obsolete situation in Ukraine. Yeah, so it's absolutely rudimental, <laughs> can say. They are very, uh, uh, they are very good, or maybe a very bad example of how little uh, changed uh, in state educational system in Ukraine since, since Soviet uh, times. And uh, finally, uh, let me tell you briefly about um, just a few words about open archive of Ukrainian media art. As I said before, I started to uh, work on it in 2008, and uh, this is a completely independent project um, uh, since 2008. Um, from time to time, I'm joined by other researchers who um, voluntarily uh, help me with various tasks, like researches, like um, content um, of the website, and so on. Uh, and in 2013, uh, we actually received, uh, the archive received a small non-government uh, support uh, grant for the creation of its website. And uh, thanks to this, uh, you can partially, uh, you can partially uh, get acquainted with the archives data database. Uh, why partially? Because uh, we try to adhere to the license rules of uh, Creative Commons and share on the, our website only those uh, videos uh, which uh, were posted online by the artists themselves. So, so in, in that way we can um, to to be like a, you know good guys without any um, uh, we, we we can to um, to to work with copyrights. Besides uh, to the video on the website, you also can read the results of research of my colleagues from different parts of Ukraine. So you can go to, for example, cities and to, to read about uh, Kiev, Lviv, Kherson, Kharkiv. Um, Mm, Odessa and so on, other cities, and for example, the same in research, you can also read uh, some text of my colleagues about uh, different uh, topics about Ukrainian media art. And um, I need to say that uh, in last few uh, few years it became better and better, uh, but support of Ukrainian ma media art for the artists still in not a good position because we still don't have, uh, as I said before, any museums, any institutions, um, any galleries, um, any art schools uh, for media art precisely. So it was my briefly, briefly <laughs> report and I think I made it in time, so maybe you have a questions to me and I will be happy to answer it if you have it. Thank you. And I'm stop demonstration of the screen. Thank you, Yina, so much. Uh, maybe you. I have one question. Uh, sorry if I missed this uh, in, your, in your talk. So how big, uh, if we're talking about numbers, <laughs> how big no, is no, it no, right no. now? <laughs> no. Yeah, it's maybe half of the thousand of uh, half of the thousand uh, files. It's mm -hmm. like a video art, digital art, um, I don't know, soft yes for of video art. So yeah, it's quite big, but unfortunately any uh, state museum uh, still can to take it for the collection, you know, because it's difficult for them because they used to collect, for example, uh, sculptures and uh, pictures and uh, so on. And uh, for example, to take for them um, uh, files uh, in the collection, it's a really big problem for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a very uh, common uh, problem for. Yeah. Uh, all the post-Soviet countries. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yes, uh, well. Thank you, thank you very much for your, thank for you. your thank invitation you. and for, for all, thanks. Yes, 
I thought about this, uh, this three generations of new media mm -hmm. arts. This is mm -hmm. the same uh, in Russia. Actually, the same is uh, in Mexico, for instance, because I talked about this with my Mexican friend. Uh, she's also an artist, and she said uh, that they also have this three generations of new media artists in Mexico. So that's interesting. Well, yes, thank you so much. And we are inviting our next speaker. Um, Daria Parhominko. Uh, she's a curator and she's a founder of uh, uh, Art and Science Media Lab, uh, Laboratory Art and Science Space, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> laboratory uh, art and science space and actually this is uh, the first institution in Russia uh, dedicated to art and science and uh, uh, Dara will present uh, uh, her talk about interspecies communication in uh, art and science. Thank you. Hello everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today and to speak and to participate in arts, even this, uh, in these strange times, uh, everything is online. So hello to everyone. Uh, and also thanks uh, Olga and Yelena for inviting me. Uh, I want in this very tiny speech talk today uh, to touch my uh, latest um, research and uh, to, to tell you a little bit of uh, upcoming show, which we are hoping, hoping that really uh, will open this year because due to pandemic, everything is postponing. The show is called May the Other Live in Me. And this, uh, you may guess, is uh, again uh, about um, communication uh, with non-human species. So um, I would touch a little bit the, this topic uh, and my research and show you several works which will participate in this exhibition. Um, today in the age of Anthropocene, we are starting to understand ourselves as a past, as a, as a part of vast community of biological species and technical systems. Are we able to build successful communication strategies with our new companions, like bacteria and trees, um, Earth's atmosphere and emergent AIs? In order to do that, we need to rethink our models of interaction with the other and develop new semiotically engineered systems allowing us to speak inside this holistic world. In this, um, in this way, collaboration with artists and scientists can be very productive. Uh, to who know that Laboratoria is specializing on uh, particularly uh, building platforms uh, of collaborations of artists and scientists. Um, in this exhibition, um, we have several projects, of course, where artists and scientists build together new interfaces. But uh, first, we start uh, seeing the presentation I wanted to quote uh, for me, a uh, very important book uh, for this topic by Donna Haraway, uh, staying with the troublemaking king in the Hthulhu Sen. Just want to quote a small piece which I admire here. I'm a compostist, not a posthumanist. We are all compost not post-human. The boundary is that is that is Anthropocene, Capitalocene, means many things, including that immense irreversible destruction is really in train, not only for 11 billion of, of people or so, we will be on the earth near the end of 21st century, but for myriads of other creatures too. The edge of extinction is not just a metaphor. System collapse is not a thriller. Ask any refugee of any species. Bacteria and fungi abound to give us metaphors. But metaphors aside, we have a mammal job to do with our biotic and abiotic symbiotic collaborators and collaborators. We need to make kin synchronically, symbiotically. We are whatever we are, we need to make with, become with, compose with, earthbound. 
So this, I want to, to, to mention that she says that we are all compost. So compost, we need to be all like uh, all together. So that model, that paradigm where um, human was controlling all what is non-human is not working so well anymore. And um, we can't control um, uh, climate, global warming. We can't control mutating of bacteria and others. In this way, we really need to find new languages, new ways to communicate with the other. But the very important thing that these new languages should be really, truly new languages, not the languages that we think we speak with the trees, like we observe the tree, we hug the tree, but the real language that the tree can communicate with us. So let's see several works, um, uh, uh, several works. One second. I think it doesn't work. One second. I hope this works, yeah? That my presentation you can see, right? Yes. 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 Thank you. So one of the works I want to, to show is um, this fantastic art piece of Sasha Spachal. She is a Slovenian artist, and this is the work where this is inhalation station where she proposed visitors uh, to come and inhale mycobacterium vacai. This is a special bacteria which we have a lot in soil. But if we don't uh, come so close to the soil, we have no possibility to inhale them so much. These special bacteria, they uh, provoke in the human organism um, uh, hormones of serotonin, raising this hormone and giving us a better mood and better work of our brain. Uh, this actually, this this uh, this strategy I call uh, um, symbiosis. And in our exhibition, me the other live and me, we will have three strategies to to, to communicate with the other. Uh, another strategy is um, dialogue. And the dialogue is just what I mentioned. The dialogue means that the special way uh, the other can also feel us. In this uh, amazing work of Agnes Meyer Brandis, the artist from Germany, she invent, together with the chemists and other scientists, she invent uh, the way to, to receive, to extract um, the smell, the perfume of the tree, of the very tree that we have in the uh, exhibition. This perfume, um, or this, let's say, yeah, the perfume, the smell we, we will have in the exhibition, the visitors can put on themselves and come to the tree and become another tree to that very tree we will have in the exhibition. Uh, this is scientifically proved that uh, trees can communicate with each other with the help of the smell and these chemical reactions. In this way, we won't feel something maybe special, but the tree will feel that it's another tree to it. So in this way, it's a totally new language that we can try in the exhibition. Another work, Another work called Araku uh, is in, also in this part of the exhibition, which is about dialogue. Uh, this is a system, uh, uh, neuros, uh, this is a machine learning system. We, we will come to the room and we'll see three holographic uh, pigs, which will speak to us and answer any questions of the visitors they would they would, like, they would love to uh, ask 
these machine creatures. In this way, we will talk and try to uh, rely on and to communicate to find new ways of understanding machines. Um, another, um, another section in the exhibition is about um, observation and presence. Uh, these artworks that we'll, we will have in the exhibition at Borg and Bess, uh, it's one of our productions uh, by, <coughs> Rush, um, by uh, Austrian artist Thomas Feuerstein and Russian uh, neuroscientists and robot technicians. Uh, These two robots, Borgi and Bess, they talk to each other and they don't need any human beings. So in this way, it's totally new way that we uh, propose at the exhibition not to communicate with another, but mostly to witness, to observe, and just to be present and to see when the other machines or AI robots, these actually, these very robots are really having uh, AI inside them. They look like old school, uh, creepy uh, surgery lamps uh, moving, but they are talking to each other. They are talking and discussing news, uh, real news that they read in the internet, uh, real time, and also transferring this into the language of Dostoevsky. So the whole uh, library of Dostoevsky was uh, installed and learned by these neural uh, networks. Um, so in this way, uh, we will observe and we will see how we can study what we can know from these machines. This is in this section, presence. Also, uh, mm, no, in this section, presence, we will also have these very inspiring projects, which also made the horse live in me, not, not made, made the other live in me, like the title of the show, but made the horse live in me. This is a, a radical bio performance by Art Orient and Je, uh, kind of already a pioneering an old piece, if we can say this, from 2011, uh, when Marion Lava. Uh, Jeanette was infusing immunoglobulins of the horse to herself and were like uh, feeling um, inside herself another species, the horse, and hybridizing in the, uh, for, not in a formal way, but in a real way, hybridizing with the horse. Uh, these, uh, these very models, uh, um, uh, these some of the models uh, which uh, we will show in this exhibition in the new Tretyakov gallery in our new space uh, laboratoria, which we are <clears throat> waiting to open soon. Um, uh, artists, artist scientist collaboration is uh, actually a, a very important and a natural part of experimentation in these new interfaces. So all we, what, what we are talking and what we will witness and see at this exhibition, also we can try these new interfaces um, where artists can provide their sensibilities and scientists can provide an understanding of technological abilities as usual. So what, why we always see this, um, collaboration of uh, these two uh, worlds of artists and scientists is very important and productive. Um, I think I'm, uh, I just say, I, I already finished my main topic. Maybe we can, Olga, Elena, we can go to the questions. Just, I was so hurrying up. Uh, uh, well, I'm not sure if we have some questions. Okay, then I can uh, then I can uh, have, have a look at my papers and uh, 
uh, continue. Um, but we have just a couple minutes before the start of the next. Okay, just, I, I wanted also to mention that why we need, it's also um, um, the, the main question maybe is why we need uh, to find these new ways of communication. Uh, again, okay, I will ask myself a question. Why we need to find these new interfaces to communicate with other species? why we need it yeah what for we need to communicate if we didn't communicate this way in this way before uh, i i think that um in in the in nowadays uh we really can uh see that the world is so fragile and that we can't control as we control it before so strongly um, so this paradigm totally don't work anymore and um, the only way is just to find uh, the place for human being in this new situation, in this new uh, logic of the world is <clears throat> to see it as a part among uh, AIs, among machines, among uh, bacteria, and to try to see uh, in human being, a tree or animal inside us. So to, to try to see other in us. This, in this logic, I propose to see our exhibition. So may the other live in me and to see what is in me. How would, would you see in me a machine or animal or tree or bacteria that we are afraid so much in this pandemic? They are living in us and let it be in us. That's what I want, maybe, to finish my tiny speech for today. Uh, thank you, Dara. Thank you so much. I think this is a super relevant topic, uh, at least to me, because I have some several projects about interspecies communication as well. Thank you so much. For your, uh, for your great presentation. Okay. And we are inviting our next speaker. Mm -hmm. uh, we are inviting our next speaker, um, Dmitry Bulatov. He's an uh, artist and curator at the National Center for Contemporary Arts. Uh, his research focuses on different aspects of deep media art and uh, he will talk about deep media studies. Thank you very much uh, for the possibility to join you. I will speak in Russian, and simultaneously I would like to thank uh, our colleagues who helped me with the uh, interpreter. Um, you see the presentation on your screens? It is a pleasure for me to address you. My name is Dmitry Bulatov and I'm curator at the National Center for Contemporary Art, the Baltic branch. And for 20 years already, I am researching the interaction of science and art. And this is usually called art and science. And the topic of my presentation today is the deep media. And I would like to start with the fact that uh, the existing corona crisis I see as a unique chance to reconsider our relations with the environment, especially to reconsider the connections in the part of cultural and artistical production, because these relations are founded on the tradition which uh, uses and reuses all the cliches from the Enlightenment era. This tradition distinguishes living from non-living, active from passive, and the human being is the only nexus of uh, among the living species. And if it is that so, that means that we are having a capacity to change the world for in order to achieve uh, for said goals. Well, if we reconsider this position in nowadays, it seems too anthropocentric, it seems to be too paternalistic, because it keeps on reproducing asymmetric and uh, 
irrespectable relations with the environment. And that also leads us to weird effects such as pandemics or ecological or technogenic catastrophes. So in order for us to fit into the frame of thinking which suits the contemporary world, we are to think the world differently. We are to overcome the anthropocentricity. We are to look into the living and non-living entities around us, be that viruses or bodies, algorithms or apparatuses, crystals and electric fields. We are to reconsider these entities as agents which interact with one another. Uh, speaking differently, we are to find such an approach which equates and establishes the balance in between human and non-human. And this very approach would create the reality within which the autonomy, the freedom of choice, the creativity would no longer be the specifically human traits. In order to do that, we are to make our strategies more complicated, and we are to make our models of the artistic activity, be that individual or institutional, make it more, make it bendable, make it flexible, make it more research-oriented. Art, in this sense, is seen as the cognition. It is not the entertainment industry. We are to develop the new toolbox. We are to look into the ways of cognizing the world. So these are the principles which lie within the deep media studies. And this is the very field I'm working in. These studies exist at the cross sections of art, philosophy, and science. Deep media is uh, focused on the interaction of the physical components of earth, water, and atmosphere, be that magnetic, electric, or gravi gravitational fields, and substrate elements of the technical systems, be that metals, salts, crystals, etc. And so the main, the main idea behind deep media is the rethinking of the materiality and the very conditions within which the material elements become the technic, have their technical shape. And I would give an example. This one I love a lot and I was uh, curating this project. And this is a project by Cecilia Johnson, which is called HEM. All of you must have heard about hemo hemo hemoglobin. Hemo this is, uh, this is uh, the, very, the very element which is responsible for the transportation of the oxygen into the tissues. And so the artist was working with blood, and blood is the main transport vessel for the hemoglobin. And so she, Cecilia, uh, negotiated the deal with nursery homes and she gathered 35 kilos of uh, 35 placenta and uh, she went she gathered 35 uh, kilograms of placenta and then using the traditional instruments used for the ore smelting she created a compass out of the ore which was evaporated from the blood from the placenta and here lies the metaphor of the compass and this very project this very project offers a very interesting combination of human and non-human and therefore, the deep media art may look differently. These may be highly technical objects and apparatuses. For example, this is the apparatus of the interspecies connection uh, human to mushrooms created by the Slovenian artist Sasha Svachal, or the system created by Rolf Becker, uh, which works with the data from the magnetic field of the Earth. Projects like these are to be imagined only with the usage of IT, robot techniques, and biomedical apps. And there are transitional formats as well. So for example, there is a reenactment of the well-known uh, experiments which were designed to simulate the atmosphere of the prehistoric Earth. 
which was conducted by the American artist Adam Brown, or it may be the online storytelling by Floris Kike. This list may be extended, but I would also like to note what Russian artists do. So for example, Dmitry Morozov in his artworks also draws our attention to the more symmetrical interaction of human and non-human. All the projects which he has question the human-centric optics and the notion of this optics, which tries to render matter as the passive and silent force. And so every machine, every metaphorical machine created by Morozov describes the material world on the very level of dynamic interactions. Oh, here's another example. This is uh, the performance by Yulia Borovai, which is called Crystal. And it uh, uses the strategies of existential transformation. The idea behind it lies in the communication between the body, or the human body, and the chemical chemical formula. In the very aquarium, which is filled with uh, sodium uh, sodium acetate uh, steam, there was a performer. And at a certain moment of time, this very steam was transforming into the crystal. Crystallization was taking place. And the very, and, and, and the very solution was slowly coming back on the human body through that, creating the crystallic surface. And so the author in this context wanted to state that every stage of the interaction with the solution is experienced differently by the performer. So this strategy, which is also rendered as the media anthropological strategy, presupposes presupposes the inclusion of the human being into the system of uh, natural or technological connections and the disconnection with the mechanisms of the humankind through the creation of new form in a very subjective, auteuric manner. So if we look around, we may find a lot of connect, a lot of examples for the similar communicative relations. So there are many, many interesting projects. So for example, the matter is never silent in the works by these artists. Matter is the very precondition for the creation of this new order where human and non-human interact. Therefore, in the deep media arts works, we see the wish to change the disciplinary axiomas. Firstly, artists no longer gather or accumulate visual images. They are focusing on the research of the principle which enables the the, the visuality. So for example, if the traditional media art was uh, dealing with the production of computer or moving images, the deep media art analyzes these images from the hardware perspective, the very copper, the very gold used for the creation of the images. So to put it differently, deep media art is the non-conventional digital aesthetics which Re which is constantly pushing forward the rhetorics of the culture industry. First and foremost, this is the analysis of the communicative rights of the elements which create those technical connections and therefore define the possibilities of the media. Here, I would like to start, stop my presentation. Thank you.